The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, large burning things sighted at the center of the inner solar system turns out to be self-sustaining natural phenomenon and not a one-off after all. Trails of Evil and Rails of Fury. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. This time we have an interview with Dr. Travis S. Taylor. Travis talks about his new book in the Tau Ceti Agenda series, Kill Before Dying. This is the sequel to Trail of Evil and is a great book if you like spaceship battles, incredibly cool cutting-edge speculation, and humans working their way out of tight situations through competence and courage. If you don't like those, then probably won't like the book. And we also continue with the complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. Now here's the news. The February hardcovers are here. Out now is The Black Wolves of Boston by Wen Spencer. Silas Decker had his world destroyed when he was attacked by vampires outside of New Amsterdam. He has rebuilt his life a dozen times in the last 300 years. Eloise is a virtue pledged to hunting evil. What she doesn't know is how to live in a city full of strangers who know nothing about monsters. Seth is the 16-year-old prince of Boston, ward of the Wolf King. But now the Wolf King is missing. Then there is Joshua, who believes he is a normal high school senior. His life is shattered when he wakes up in a field covered with blood and the prom committee scattered in pieces all around him. These four must now come together to unravel a plot by witches who gain power from human sacrifice and have the ability to turn any human into their puppets. Sounds delicious. Also out in hardcover is Kill Before Dying by Travis S. Taylor. Humanity takes to interstellar space to face conflict and an extermination threat from an artificial intelligence and an alien menace from beyond. We'll talk more about this great science fiction military adventure story coming up. The Black Wolves of Boston by Wynne Spencer and Kill Before Dying by Travis S. Taylor are now available at booksellers everywhere. I want to welcome Dr. Travis S. Taylor to the podcast. Hello, Travis. Hi, how's it going? Pretty good. Uh, Dr. Travis S. Taylor was the co-creator and star of the National Geographic Channel's hit series, Rocket City Rednecks, and the Weather Channel's Three Scientists Walk Into a Bar series recently. He's appeared frequently as an expert science commentator on numerous other television shows. Travis is a physicist who has worked on various programs for the Department of Defense and NASA for the past 20 years. His expertise includes advanced propulsion concepts, very large space telescopes, space-based beamed energy systems, future combat tech, and, and next-generation space loss concepts, and, uh, and knowing a lot about quantum physics also. <laughs> Travis is also the author of the groundbreaking Warp Speed series with entries Warp Speed and the Quantum Connection, and the co-author with John Ringo of four novels in the Looking Glass War series, with Jody Lynn Nye, he's the author of a young adult novel that's coming out this summer called Moonbeam. And he is the creator of cutting-edge science fiction series, The Tossetti Agenda, including One Good Soldier, The Tossetti Agenda, One Day on Mars, Trail of Evil, and Now at Booksellers Everywhere, Kill Before Dying. Uh, I got all those in, right? Didn't miss anything there? Uh, yeah, I think you got it all in there. Uh, only thing I would say is... Uh the book in the series was One Day on Mars, and then it was Tau City Agenda, then One and, and then Trail of Evil, and now Kill Before Dying. Okay. The order is off. Well, uh, in, in any case, we have come a long way from uh, the first book in the series, um, and a long way from the solar system physically by the time uh, Kill Before Dying opens. Can you kind of give us a background on the series? Can you catch us up where we are in the story? Right. So uh, in, the, in the first book, uh, One Day on Mars, uh, this is about two, three hundred years into the future. And uh, it's the 
it's the United States of the solar system or the Sol system. So Sol is the name of our sun. And Mars decides to secede from the Union on that day. And uh, a senator from Mississippi uh, just happens to be there on Mars and gets caught up in it. Turns out he's a, a former Marine, and he and his family are kept or are caught up in the fight in the war, the start of a civil war. And uh, it turns out there's no such thing as a former Marine, as any good Marine will tell you. <laughs> and and uh, he fights his family to safety and and gets caught up in the whole thing and and, and eventually gets uh, wrapped up in much more intrigue throughout the uh, rest of the series and his entire family does and, and, and the rest of the cast where it turns out there's this uh, terrorist sort of or, or, or rebel that's causing all of this in the background and through each book they get a little closer and closer to her. And I don't know how many spoilers we want to give on that, but let's just say that this main terrorist is uh, very closely linked to our main character family of uh, Alexander Moore, his wife, Sierra Moore, and their daughter, Deanna Moore. And so by the end of book three, you think the war is mostly over and uh, they've killed all the... The, the rebels and they've mopped it up in the United States of the solar system and the, the few colonies. There's one out of Tau Ceti, and which is the first one of the first colonies to secede from the Union. Uh, and and then there's one at a couple other places like in Wolf Three Five Nine, a couple other places like that. And you uh, you think it's all wrapped up, but you find at the beginning of Trail of Evil that this war was just a uh, a part of a plan to prepare mankind for something much more, much more sinister, and that the uh, this this terrorist that had all this was leading us along a trail of evil through history uh, to be prepared for what was really coming, which was an alien invasion, the likes of which uh, even John Rigo uh, doesn't write about. Well, they seem pretty nasty, um, but tell us a little bit more about Moore, Andrew Moore, as a as a man. You, he's been your main character. He's heroic. He's got an iron will, um, and you took the title Alexander Moore. Alexander Moore. I'm sorry. Uh, it, you took the title from the book from something he says. Uh, actually, the title to uh, he's about the title "Kill Before Dying." Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, no, it's not something that Alexander says. It's a conversation. So Alexander is, after he's, he becomes the leader of, of the United States during the Civil War, once the Civil War is over, he's no longer the leader, uh, meaning he's no longer president. But he, he was a, a Marine, and he's got to finish this fight, and he's so closely linked to it, and so is his family that he takes on a commission as a, uh, uh, a full-up uh, commander of the, of the Defense Forces uh, general and next day the stars to find this, to follow this trail of evil and then to be the first one to get this alien invasion. Well, and in, in the end of Trail of Evil, and I don't want to give too much of it away, but uh, Deanna Moore is done. And one of the other main characters that throughout the series is a uh, super awesome fighter mecha jock named uh, uh, his Commander, or Cap- at this point he's Captain already, Captain Jack uh, Death Ray. And uh, Death Ray and Deanna get so wrapped up in the conflict that happens in Trail of Evil that, uh, that they're hurt really bad, both physically and emotionally. And Death Ray makes the statement at the end that they don't have time to die because they got pulled by some of these aliens, and he uses some, uh, 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 you know, very graphic language to describe them. That they plan to. Ki- There's a whole bunch of these aliens that they have to kill before dying. Oh, so it's Death Ray that that says it. Yeah. 
Yeah, he's a great character. He's he's also found in in this book. Um, so, well, tell us a little bit about more uh, more. Tell us a little bit more about Alexander. Um, he's really developed. Um, I mean, he he was a politician when he began, but he's become uh, a bit of a you know a great man of human history at this point, right? Right. Well, you don't realize uh, in the first book. Uh, all of the details in the background about Alexander Moore. Uh, you know, he's from Mississippi, and he's married to a, a Martian. And, of course, by Martian, this is a human that was born on Mars. And uh, and they have a daughter. And you only know that he was a Marine during uh, the beginning of the uh, first sort of separatist movement on Mars, say, 30, 40, 50 years before he was a senator. And... And, it, and apparently he went through some really bad stuff, and this evil terrorist person who was leading this actually physically tortured him uh, in torture camp during the background to all of this. And this happened 30, 40 years before the books. And so you get the impression that Alexander Moore was really tough in his day. And then you realize that he, or he, he's there as a politician. When it's time to not be the politician to be the, the super awesome badass to protect his family, he comes back to being there's no such thing as a former Marine, and he starts kicking butt. And then, as he evolves in the second book, you, you begin to get more and more about his background history, and you realize that he was an awesome soldier then, and he gets put into situations, even as a politician, where he has to stand up and fight for his life, and indeed fight for his family's safety. Uh, and, and each time he does so, he does it like nobody but Alexander Moore could. And he evolved on into this new series. You know, he starts out, you know, he's General Moore now and not politician Moore. And any time there's a problem, his troops are getting overrun, his daughter's trapped uh, in a bad situation, the, there's... There needs to be some snowflake to create an avalanche that turns the tide of a battle. Alexander wades in where God's spirit tread and turns the tides of the battle. And uh, he, he really is uh, that soldier of history, that man of history who is, who without Alexander Moore, it's likely that uh, humanity is going to get wiped out by this uh, oncoming alien invasion. So I take it that you you sort of, at least in the book, subscribe to the uh, the great man theory of <laughs> of history to some extent. Yeah, well, I mean, you can go back and uh, look throughout history and find you know great men that uh, history wouldn't have necessarily been able to be turned out the way it that particular great men, whether they were great men of intelligence great men of physical capabilities, great men of strategy, uh, you know, whatever that is, great men that can endure things. You know, for example, we might not have ever known that the POWs in Vietnam were being tortured uh, had uh, uh, Jeremiah Denton, uh, a fighter pilot, had been shot down and and taken prisoner and tortured, not uh, blinked torture in Morse code while they were uh, having him tell how, how horrible the United States was. And, you know, I sort of, uh, I met Jeremiah Denton, and he became a senator of Alabama when I was a kid. Yeah. And uh, he was one of my heroes. He was one of my heroes. And so Alexander Moore is kind of based loosely on uh, Jeremiah Denton. Aha, uh-huh. I can see that. He was, um, he was actually a, a deacon in my church when I was in college. <laughs> So I've met him a couple of times. That was before. That was when he was a, uh, I believe, a representative at first. Anyway, but uh, yeah. Yeah, he was a first, and then he was a senator, yeah. So speaking of uh, Alexander Moore's family, uh, he has a daughter, Deanna, who is a kick-ass mecha-using Marine. Um, Can you tell us about Dee and maybe go into some of the technical capabilities of that armor she uses as well? Right, okay, so D starts out as, uh, 
she's about, I'm going to say, if I remember right, about eight years old in the first book. And they're on Mars, and and they're going through all this, you know, stuff's happening. And at the end of the, at the book, one of the last things that you, one of the last scenes in the book is uh, um, Alexander Moore is putting his daughter to bed, you know, reads, reads her a story. Or, or and, and she's like, well, Daddy, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. And he's like, really? You want to be a politician? And she's like, ooh, yuck, no. I want to be a kick-ass Marine. And so that set the stage right there for Deanna's life to become her father, right? But even more than that. And uh, so it, as each book is about six years apart, and so by the time we get to uh, Trail of Evil and then now Kill Before Dying, uh, Deanna is a, a full-up adult. She is now um, Major Moore. And uh, as her father once had been back during the uh, what we call the Martian Desert, he was being tortured, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And so now she's at the pinnacle of her you know, young first career as a marine fighter mecha, uh, mecha fighter pilot and so she flies these awesome uh, fm 12 uh marine fighting mecha and in the later books they becomes the fm uh, 14x's and i'll talk about that maybe but uh, and these things they're like a fighter a space fighter in one configuration they can transfigure into uh, giant walking uh, armored bots with uh, all sorts of weapons attached to them. And they can also transfigure into uh, like a, a hybrid between the bot and the, and the, uh, the space fighter. That's called, so there's bot mode, there's fighter mode, and there's eagle mode. And, and it looks, think of it like an eagle where it has hands and feet, but also the wings. So it has kind of the same... Uh, capabilities as a fighter and the bot. Uh, there's a mix of the fight, flight envelope. But now, but beyond that, each individual Marine uh, suit. So they're called AEMs, Armored Environment Marine, uh, Armored Environment Suit Marines, which basically is powered armor, but uh, powered armor that's got all sorts of uh, connectivity and things that you wouldn't think of. They have direct-to-mind interfaces. Uh, you think about it now, we're right at the cutting edge of technology where uh, we have people in wheelchairs or amputees that have uh, that can control with a special cap that they wear, with special sensors. They can actually control the, uh, the devices. They can type by thinking about letters. They can actually cause their fingers to wiggle on their robotic hands by thinking about it once they train themselves. And, and the computer system. So it's, well, interface is the norm, and it'll be like a smartphone for everybody. You know, instead of having a tactile interface, we have a screen and buttons to push. It's all inside your mind. It goes directly to your thought process. Your heads-up display is in front of your, your eyes where only you can see, and you can hear the interface. It's so much more efficient. And they, this allows for much more precise control of the weapon systems, of flying their spacecraft, uh, the fighter craft, and it makes combat such a dizzying pace that um, you would, these people wearing these armor and having this capability would seem superhuman. They also have, um, I mean, I want to talk about it later, but there's a there's an AI that's part of the uh, the powered armor as well. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. So let me before I get to the AI, the one more thing I would add to the armor is uh, the engineer from the the flagship called the Sienna, USS Sienna Madeira, um, and that engine, chief engineer is uh, a commander. Uh, Joe Buckley Jr., he has invented a type of barrier shield that first they could only do in small parts on the uh, the main battleships, took too much power, and then each book it kind of evolved. 
And now it's actually even on the individual fighters and on the individual armored suits. And it, can, and it makes the armor withstand much more impacts and, and damage. And so it makes them even, even tougher. Yeah, and so, yeah, the uh, artificial intelligence, from very early on, the first uh, book, the uh, inside everybody's brain, uh, just their ear, little sunflower seed-sized component, that's a, a, a quantum uh, supercomputer. And uh, inside that, that quantum supercomputer is an actual seed, artificial intelligence. Now, and it's not just a made-up artificial intelligence, and, and you can say, well, you know, We've been using that for years, but the point about this is you are not going to get an intelligent machine most likely just by adding connections. Like the Internet's never going to come to life like Skynet because it's just a bunch of connected data packets running together without its own um, mechanism for creating non-computational uh, solutions meaning everything that, uh, and connected to it has to follow certain calculation rules. Well, in quantum computers, that's not the case. Computers naturally come based on the rules of quantum mechanics that uh, sometimes the, the answer is... And I know it sounds weird, but let me explain it. Say that again. Computation. You, you dropped out your main point there. Huh? Say it one more time. The answer is sometimes. Right. So with a quantum computer, the answer uh, that, that it comes to sometimes is a thing that is non-computable, meaning there are no, no sets of standard equations you can write that would give you this solution. But the rules of quantum physics are the only thing that we know of is allows you to have these solutions. They are viable solutions, but they fall out of the rules of quantum physics. They're not computable or, or, or calculatable. So, uh, and then it just sort of happened. And the only thing like that uh, known to man, really, other than quantum events, is consciousness. Yeah. And so that's the key that leads a lot of, there's a big school of thought right now, that consciousness itself is a quantum phenomena. And so the mechanism for consciousness must therefore be a quantum device. And our consciousness is in our brains, so it's most likely that our brains are actually quantum computers. And there's more evidence to suggest this as well, but just assume for now that that's the case, then... Once we create quantum computers, that's when it's likely that we could actually create a true AI, a true sentient, uh, you know, component, not just connecting a bunch of internet hubs together. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that you have a lot. <laughs> we had a we had a fascinating discussion about this um, a couple of weeks ago, you and I, and um, you almost convinced me it's true. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> We're talking about real science, though. It's quite possible that um, there is a quantum uh, component to human consciousness, you think? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced of it. Uh, to the point that, you know, a scientist can be. Uh, we definitely need to do more experimentation and, and more study and, and to figure it all out for sure. And I wouldn't be, I would, I would not be amazed if it turns out it's not the case. But uh, all the information I have to this point, I'm, I'm very strongly, like 90%, convinced that, uh, this, that, it, that your brain is a quantum computational uh, machine. Wow. So imagine having one of these supercomputers that's your best buddy implanted inside your brain and can wirelessly connect to everything, all the internets and everything everywhere. And so... Think how more efficient you are. Think how more efficient you are now. I was just telling somebody, a kid today that's working for me, I showed him how it uh, had all these references, like 21, 20-something references in this paper I was writing. And I said, I, you know, I found them in a day on the Internet. And I said, back when I was his age, I'd have to go to the library and spend a month in the library finding all those papers and reading through them. 
So think how more efficient we are today and now extrapolate that 300 years into the future. Yeah, I mean, I would I want to have a I'd love to have a podcast sometime with you and uh and some other uh maybe um uh Rob Hampson and some others to to see what uh, you know, like a round table on consciousness sometime. I think that'd be fun. But anyway, uh so Oh yeah, that would be fun. Back to the book. Another fun character is uh somebody you mentioned who's Joe Buckley. Um Joe Buckley keeps having terrible things happen to him in your books. And um in this one he may even lose part of himself, literally. But um he also comes up with these amazing fixes. So can you tell us about Joe and what is the legendary Buckley maneuver? Yeah, so this is uh, Joe Buckley Jr. Now, his father was a uh, a technician, a petty officer, first class, if I recall, uh, in the first book, One Day on Mars, working down in the... He, his job was to be in charge of all the fluids flowing around this giant supercarrier that's, you know three or four or five kilometers long, a couple of kilometers wide, and, uh, it's, you know, 10,000 people living on it all the time. And so there's a lot of fluids, as you can imagine, the sewage, the water, and so on. And, and, and it's a serious engineering endeavor, if you think about controlling the sewage on a spacecraft that size. Now, with that many people on it, I mean, it cost us, you know, uh, tens of millions of, uh, of, I mean, billions of dollars to create over time, over the life cycle of the International Space Station, to have figured out a way to handle the sewage. Uh, There was a clever uh, experiment they did with it a couple years ago, and I think it was something like, uh, uh, you know, a $70 million experiment to uh, adjust the sewage handling capability on the space station. And it's tiny compared to one of the two. So Buckley Sr., uh, during a horrendous firefight, and all the uh, the laser weapons on the, uh, or the direct energy weapons on board the, the Siena Madeira was overheated, and none of the coolant was able to flow because it had been you know, shot out and it leaked out, had the brilliant idea that in order to save the ship, and they would turn the guns back on, that he could flow the sewage through the cooling system. And it works, sort of. <laughs> and then uh, Buckley Sr. dies in a, in a horrific explosion of methane and sewage. So his son, who wanted to be like his father and became a Navy, uh, he, he actually went to graduate school and, and became a Navy officer and a chief engineer of... of he moves into the Siena Madeira and become, eventually becomes their chief engineer. Well, during a battle, something very similar happens where they need to go into uh, hyperspace in a hurry, and they can't get back between the power system and the the hyperspace vortex generator, which, uh, which by the way, I based on a theory of a uh, called a Krasnikov tube. Uh, theory, which is written in a lot of quantum gravity and uh, physics journal article papers nowadays about how to do faster than light. All the things in my books, while they may sound fantastical, they're based on some real scientific concepts. Anyway, during the process, Buckley has to, uh, him and a, and a technician, I think, or no, it's a fireman's apprentice, I think. Anyway, they uh, end up using a, a BFW, which is a big effing wrench, to uh, beat a pipe loose, drag some big cables between the pipe and the uh, and the power system, and then use the pipe to channel all the power over to uh, across the room, and then it hooks the cables from the pipe back into the vortex generator, and then when they turn, they let all the power loose. It, it it works temporarily, and, of course, it fries everything in the room with extremely high-power gamma rays. And 
they don't turn into the Hulk, they are pretty much cooked and they're about to die. Uh, but this is 300 years in the future and medical technology is much more advanced than we have it. And so they managed to, uh, Buckley manages to live to be, Buckley Jr. manages to live to be fried again at, at another <laughs> period. <laughs> but he's clever, he's smart, and he is the sort of my, uh, my Scotty, if you will. Yeah, he does some really cool stuff, and he has a great. Uh, he has a few great lines in the book as well, much like Scotty. Um, you were talking about the science. You know, we have a great article you wrote at the website, and soon to be collected in our free ebook at Bain eBooks, which is called Free Nonfiction 2017. If you want to download it, um, it's all about the science and science fiction extrapolation in the in the uh, Talsetti Tal Agenda series. Um, you were talking about some of it now. Can you go into uh, some more, particularly the, the quantum phenomenon and uh, how the FTL works, maybe? Yeah, sure. So uh, the the uh, the first, when they start this, uh, they don't have quantum membrane teleportation, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute. In fact, that's a key uh that, that triggers most of all this whole whole series. But uh, they, they have faster than light travel that takes them, say, oh, a month or two to travel from Earth out past the Oort cloud or out to the Oort cloud in the Kuiper belt in that area. So uh, to go to the nearest star system takes, you know, 18 months to a couple years uh, to get to the nearest colony, which is about, uh, I think it's, Tau Ceti is around 10 light years away or so. I forget the exact number. I think it's closer, between 10 and 11 somewhere. And it takes them, if they use that technology, a couple of years, uh, although they're driving faster than speed of light, they're just not, but, you know, a few times faster. It uses the concept of creating a, uh, a, a cube on one end of space uh, Space time and a two and an opening to managing to keep that tube open with uh, exotic matter, which is just matter that uh, violates uh, a thing known as the weak energy condition in quantum physics. Basically, means it, do, it doesn't um, act like normal matter. So you can sort of, uh, it, if you held two chunks of this exotic matter close to each other they would fall away from each other instead of toward each other. We don't know how to build that, but we theoretically believe it might. we might could someday. And anyway, so inside this tube, the speed of light would be much faster than the speed of light in regular space. So then you could travel faster without having the problem of special relativity uh, come into play. Now, in order to really get there fast, they used these, they invented is quantum membrane technology. So quantum a membrane is uh, something similar to a, a string, except it's a membrane, kind of like the top of a drum, the snare of a snare drum, that tight material, that's a membrane. And you can imagine that each sort of phenomenology or plane of existence or energy phenomena in our universe is one of these membranes. And... So space and time could be represented as this membrane. And if you connect quantum phenomena uh, from one place to another, then you could, uh, they're all there and keep them connected. Then things can happen between them instantaneously, no matter how far away they are. This is Einstein's spooky action at a distance. So there's a quantum membrane uh, teleporter that you you have on one end, and then you use your your faster than light travel capability to take a, the other piece of it as far away as you can. Then what you do, you can instantaneously teleport between these two two components. Now, in the second book, they develop a way to sling forward uh, from a quantum teleportation pad uh, out, you know, a light year or two, and then you're still connected, so you have sort of a portable uh, quantum teleportation pad with you. You sling it forward, 
And then to get back, you snap back. You basically imagine it like you stretch a rubber band out. And then when you let it go, it pulls you, you it yanks you back. And that's the sling forward and snap back algorithms that I talk about. Um, so they're basically stretching and, and, and snapping these membranes. So eventually, as the technology gets better and better, they uh, figure out how to use that to travel faster than using the hyperspace systems by slinging forward and then stopping and then slinging forward again and slinging forward. And, and once you've ever been anywhere with these quantum teleportation pads, that coordinate system is then connected to that teleportation system, and you can go back to that. It becomes a hub, sort of like an Internet hub. You can bounce to it whenever you want to. And this is how they set up a mechanism to travel much deeper into space without it taking years and years and years and years. And then in Trail of Evil, they actually find some of these that are extremely, extremely far uh, away from where we thought mankind had been. And I don't want to give too much of that away, because that's kind of a fun, hidden story. But um, the bad guys that, that placed them, or the actual, the bad guy who was really sort of a good guy, setting humanity up for this invasion, was setting these nuggets uh, of technology out through uh, the local feeding us toward the invasion so we could greet the invasion before it gets to actual our home world. Well, let's, um, let's talk about where we open with, um, with, um, kill before dying. So Alexander Moore has, is meeting an alien commander, at least meeting by a quantum communication who, um, just kind of set up the book. Who gives more a job for humanity in fighting this this menace? Are they called the Chiata? Uh, yeah, the Chiata. Chiata. Like uh, pronounced pronounced K E Y uh, A T A. Chiata. So this so, uh, or almost like Pinata, except it's Chiata. Uh, so the Chiata, um, right? The the Chiata are the are these. Extremely super fast aliens that, are, that the first time we encounter them in Trail of Evil, we can't even see them. They move so fast, our sensors can't even slow them down. They're blurs like Superman would be, you know. Uh, and they also have these uh, tendril-like uh, uh, spear-headed ten tendrils that shoot out from them and capture their prey or kill their prey, wrap them up, entangle them, slow them down, whatever. They have uh, shields and weapon systems, but what they don't have is the quantum teleportation technology. They have standard hyperdrive kinds of systems, the, like the Vortex tube I'm talking about, but they're much faster than ours, but nowhere near as fast as the quantum membrane teleportation. That's our only saving grace, our only force multiplier. But at the beginning of Kill Before Dying... Uh, at the end of the previous book, we had gone and had our first engagement with Kiata, and the Kiata kicked our ass. So we're, uh, we come back, and we lick our wound. Some allies, uh, which I won't go into yet because it will give a bunch of things away, uh, managed to link us to this alien race that is in the Kiata for millennia. And... They tell us that there is a star system not too awful far from where humanity was, is able to reach, uh, something like 700 light years from Earth. And these, at this star system, the Kiata have not chewed this star system up for resources or made a habitat out of it like they usually do. There's something special about the star system that they, nobody, that even these advanced aliens have been around for millions of years longer than we have, haven't been able to figure out what they, what the deal is with the system because any time you teleport into one of these systems, you can't get out. I mean, into this system, you can't get out. So you go there, you're going to be stuck. And so the, um, 
Alexander puts a team together of volunteers, and they go out there with uh, super carriers and fighting Mecca. And, of course, his daughter and Death Ray are part of the fighter team. And they get there, and Dee manages to get herself uh, shot down and is stuck on this planet. And that's where uh, a lot of mayhem ensues. Yeah. Speaking of that, so a puking death blossom, what is that? Yeah, so I've been using puking de- death blossoms for the fighting mecha uh, since the very first book. And that's uh, actually it's paying homage to an old uh, TV show called The Last Starfighter that I watched when I was a kid. There's a thing in there, a uh, maneuver called a death blossom. Mm. Where a space fighter in the automatic mode and spins in every direction and targets everything in his path and fires at it, but it can only handle it for so long before it would kill the occupant pilot or uh, the system overloads. Well, the uh, actual Air Force and, and Navy and Marine pilots today all going into a flat spin during combat, uh, a puking death blossom. Because if you survive when you get out of it, you're throwing up because you're spinning so wildly that your system can't handle it. And have to recover from that so quickly that if you don't, you're going to die, either crash into the ground or get shot down. So I just extrapolated this into space, like uh, with the last Starfighter. But in this case, Fugue Death Blossom is planned. If you're in overwhelming numbers... You can put your mecha into a 360-degree random targeting spin and have your AI system uh, engage every target it can target with every weapon system you have, and it can turn the numbers game back closer to your favor. The problem is most of the record... The average human can only last about 18 seconds in a puking death blossom. And uh, before they pass out, throw up and gag and suffocate, and their suit has to bring them back. Now, uh, Death Ray has the record of something like uh, 28 seconds, if I remember right. <clears throat> and Deanna Moore is dead set on going to break his record. <laughs> well, she, she gets her chance to try. Um, what are some other weapons in the book? Can you, uh, especially like what, the Kiatis, uh Blue Rays? Um, you explain wh- the way it might work, and it seems super cool. Your explanation of their uh, of their evil rays. So, yeah, yeah, the Kiata have just these massive directed energy weapons that our fighter, our pilots, and our captains of our super carriers call blue beams of death from hell or BBDs for short, but the Blue Beams of Death from Hell are so incredibly powerful that, uh, you know, they burst through the barriers, the Buckley barrier shield and the hull plating, uh, armor, structural integrity fields, and they just destroy our supercarriers quickly, extremely quickly. And not only that, is you, you can't even use things like an asteroid or something for cover because this directed energy beam can turn corners. Can do what? Big, powerful blue beam, it can turn corners. Oh, okay. So um, uh, imagine this big blue energy beam that can zig and zag through space around debris until it gets to its target. And most people say, well, wait, light doesn't travel in zigs and zags, and you take a laser pointer and shine it across the sky, it goes in a straight line. Well... Not necessarily. Actually, we know that gravity will actually bend the path of a light beam. Uh, This was proven, uh, Einstein predicted it in his theory of general relativity back in uh, 1905. And in 1919, uh, it was proven by uh, some astronomers went uh, to, trekked out in the Antarctic during a total solar eclipse and saw that stars that were supposed to be very close to the limb of the sun were actually, their position seemed to be in a different place, 
because the gravitational pull of the sun was actually bending the light and making it look like they were somewhere else. Uh, another example of this, if, if you uh, shine a beam of, of, of beam of light like a laser pointer into a swimming pool, you can see the beam bend when it hits the water and change. So if you change the density of space-time or the index of refraction of space-time uh, where there's a change in it, the light bends its path. So now imagine these advanced aliens have a capability to fire a uh, beam of gravitons or some type of gravitational manipulation uh, system uh, function in front of the blue beam such that it changes the index of refraction and causes the beam to bend in the direction they need it to steer. Now, that sounds fantastical, but it's possible, and it's within the laws of physics. So imagine now you have a steerable, guidable, uh, directed energy weapon. That, that's exciting and fun. Yeah. What are, um, what are some of the weapons the humans have against this, this uh, scourge? Well, you know, they have missiles that have uh, uh, quark-based uh, fissile material that uh, is extremely large, like bigger, much, much bigger, orders of magnitude bigger than any nuclear weapon we ever created. They have direct energy, uh, and one of the, the and they have the mecha with uh, directed energy weapons and plasma cannons that shoot big balls of 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 plasma. Uh, that's hot as the sun, so imagine a volleyball-sized sun smacking into you at near light speed. And they also have developed uh, shields. Other than the quantum technology, you know, teleport around, which the aliens don't have, the uh, shield is one of the key things that, that's keeping humanity in the fight. And I think, you know, in this book, in this series of books, I actually explained from a physics standpoint how a shield could work. And I've never read anywhere in scientific papers or in a science fiction book a real explanation of barrier shields. And so the way I present that this would could possibly work is using this capability they have to manipulate the quantum membranes, uh, well, however that is, right? It's 300 years in the future. I don't know how we do that yet. But you manipulate the quantum uh, probabilities in a region around whatever it is you're trying to protect in such that you use uncertainty principle to protect you. So if someone fires a bullet at you and, and there's a barrier in the bullet that once the bullet enters that barrier – all of a sudden, uh, the barrier measures its energy of the bullet precisely so that you can't know its position. And this means, in, in, in essence, what this would happen, well, I mean, what would happen is it would cause the bullet to go off in some random vector. So it would look like the bullet bounced off of you and went off in some random scattered way. And so by actually applying this field of uncertainty in quantum physics around you, you create an actual barrier shield. And I, that's, I know we're, we're a long way from creating something like this, but I think it's the first time that there's a, a viable barrier shield might be hmm. without creating new physics. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, what, uh, while you're with us, can you uh, tell us a little bit about your project with uh, Jody, Lynn, and I, um, Moonbeam, and uh, what are you up to? It's a young adult novel. Yeah, so um, the uh, Tau City Agenda series is definitely an adult science fiction, uh, milita hard military, hard science. There's extreme graphic violence in it, and a little bit of sex, uh, but a lot of language. So I definitely, it's not a young adult series. But this series, 
uh, I wanted to write a series that I could get my kids, let my kids read now. And uh, my daughter's 12, and it's right, she could read this. Uh, and so this is a young adult series that takes place about 50 to 100 years in the future. It's the first colony, the first city on the moon. It's called Armstrong City. And there's a scientist there uh, who is a TV celebrity scientist who has a fun science show that he, that is filmed and played live from the moon. And he has a group of teenagers that work with him on the show. And there's this competition to hire a new a replacement teenager as one of them aged out or quit, whichever the case may be. And... Um, and so this girl from Iowa wins the competition, and this this first book, Moonbeam, is about her first day on the moon, joining the team, and uh, this scientist sends them on their first mission to go to the far side of the moon to build this radio telescope uh, using a, a moon crater as the dish. And while they're out there, a coronal mass ejection occurs, a big solar flare, and they get trapped in a very dangerous situation. And these teenagers then have to figure out a way to survive the harshness of this uh, solar flare while on the far side of the moon, cut off from the rest of uh, the lunar colony or the lunar city. And it, it's a lot of fun. It's real down-to-earth. I mean, it's modern science extrapolated just 50 to 100 years into the future. It's not aliens, it's not warp drives, it's living on the moon and, and filming a TV show on the moon and doing experiments on the moon and being uh, a coming-of-age teenager uh, and a scientist and a, and, and a mayor to a city. I mean, it's all, and people on the moon, and you see what's going on. And I think it's going to be, if this one turned out really exciting, uh, I think uh, Jody and I really enjoyed doing it. And uh, we're looking forward to doing hopefully many more here, uh, with these characters. Do we have a name for a series? Well, right now, Jody and I call it the Moon Series. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and every and our goal and our thoughts are that every one of the titles of the books will be like this one is Moon Beam. Mm -hmm. uh, the what the, the the sequel uh, will be about a great race around to cir circumnavigate the moon uh, that our, our teenagers and our scientists build the, you know, a, a, a race car to go in the race. And we're thinking about calling it Moon Tracks. And there's another reason for calling it Moon Tracks, but I don't want to give that away yet. Um, but it has to do with footprints. Hint, hint. Uh-huh. Um, well, uh, what other Travis Taylor projects are afoot? What are you working on? So, I'm wanting to sort of wrap up this fight uh, with the uh, uh, the Kiata out in space with the Moore family and Death Ray and all those. So I'm also working on the uh, sequel to, to uh, uh, Kill Before Dying, which right now it looks like it's going to be called Bringers of Hell. And I'm almost done. I'm, I'm halfway done with it. And... As far as other projects, I also actually have a, uh, in my day job, I have experiences going on the International Space Station uh, within the next year, and so I'm spending a lot of time working on that. That's really cool. Can you, there are a few, can you talk about it, or is it? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about it. There's um, um, a lot of people are using small, very, very small satellites to do things in space now. And by very small, they call them nano-satellites. They're about the size of a loaf of bread or a 12-pack of soft drinks. And um, the problem is we keep trying to use concepts for these big, giant spacecraft that we've been using, satellites that are as big as a car, to control... And, and manipulate our spacecraft that are now the size of a loaf of bread. And it doesn't really work well. So I came up with a bunch of sensors and concepts and ideas that we could pack into a small experiment that's the size of one of these satellites 
but we want to be able to get data from it 24-7, 365 for a year to two years. In most cases, these little satellites burn out after a few months, and we only get a little bit of data from them as their orbit brings them around over a ground station. So I thought, well, the best way to do this would be to put it on the space station because we'll get data from the space constantly, year-round, all the time. And so I'm going to put one of these little satellites on the back porch, so to speak, of the space station and get data from it continuously for a year to hopefully make our understanding and knowledge of how these little bitty spacecraft work in space and it will make the next generation of these spacecraft better and uh, we'll be able to understand them and control them better. Well, that is, that's really cool. The science fiction that Travis currently has out there is the book Kill Before Dying by Travis S. Taylor. It's now at booksellers everywhere. Uh, Travis, thank you very much for being with us. Hey, hey, you're welcome. Uh, I was going to plug one more thing. I just finished the second edition of my uh, international best-selling rocket science textbook for college, for undergraduate school, Introduction to Rocket Science and Engineering. It just came, uh, I just finished it. It'll come out uh, just in time for fall classes. So uh, cool. for the science fiction readers out there that want to learn about rocket science, that'll be out there too. What's the title again? It's called an, uh, Introduction to Rocket Science and Engineering, Second Edition. And uh, my publisher on that is uh, CRC Press. Wow, it's probably pretty useful for science fiction writers, too, to get a copy of that. Well, if you want to write about rockets, this is the introdu- it's written to be an introductory textbook for undergraduate students on how to build rockets. Well, that's really cool. Well, thanks a lot, Travis. Hey, thank you. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. It seems Cinnabar's chief spymaster is a mother also, and her son is determined to search for treasure in the midst of a civil war. Who better to hold the boy's hand and to take the blows directed at him than Captain Daniel Leary, the Republic of Cinnabar Navy's troubleshooter, and his friend the cyberspy Adele Mundy. The only thing certain in the struggle for control of the mining planet Corsera is that the rival parties are more dangerous to their own allies than to their opponents. Daniel and Adele face kidnappers, pirates, and a death squad even before they can get to the real business of ending the war on Corsera and bringing their charge home, maybe along with ancient alien treasure. Now here is the next entry of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. She was using light amplification with enhanced contrast rather than thermal imaging. The river Cephasis was a brown glitter curving back and forth through paddies which were a mixture of black and green. During the day, a shadow bordered the levee on the side away from the sun, but now before dawn the high earthen banks blended into the fields below. The hundred feet of channel nearest the Pantellarian lines swelled like the surface of a swamp when a bubble rises through it. The swelling burst outward. Its center dimpled down into a crater, but ripples continued to spread. The initial wavefront must have been twenty feet high as it coursed across the soft ground. All it left behind was a flat of mud which continued to tremble. The river drained with a steady swiftness of sunrise, eating away the ends of the severed levees in its tumbling rush. The silt which had built the bottom of the channel a dozen feet above the plain had no mechanical strength to resist the powerful flow. The blast had homogenized all the soil in the path of the shock wave, but the sheet of water spread a luster over it. Is six all right, Vessie said. Were they clear? I didn't know what that was going to do. Adele raised her display's magnification. For a moment, she couldn't find the truck which held the command group. I didn't know what the blast was going to do either. But then she cued the console to highlight movement. There was the truck, still right side up and racing directly away from the Cephasis. Adele would have had to raise magnification further to be sure that Daniel was still in the vehicle, but for now she could assume he was safe. 
The truck had been a mile from the charge and inside one of the channel's slow curves. As it expanded the explosion crater, the shock wave liquefied several miles of levee. A suspension of mud and water slumped onto the plain. Instead of providing shelter, the earthen walls had almost flowed over the truck and buried it. The miners had used the same explosive that they did to shatter rock, ammonium nitrate doped with fuel oil to sensitize it. They had said that it was perfectly safe, and Daniel had calmly agreed. In checking, Adele found that the farmers in the Delta used the same material as fertilizer. At some level, she seemed to have assumed that the explosion wouldn't be very impressive. The detonation of tens of tons of ammonium nitrate was impressive. In this finely divided silt, the devastation looked like the result of a meteor strike. Strong point three had vanished. The earth had opened, not in a crack, but by losing cohesion. It had sucked in the troops Adele had deluded a few days earlier. She thought about the peasants Hogg had spared in the listening post. If they had gone back to the same duty, they were dead now. If not, their replacements were dead. Everyone dies, I will die. South of the Pantellarian positions, pink tubes of structural plastic rolled to the surface of the mud and rolled back under again, the linings of the dugouts of Independence forces. The troops within a mile of the explosion had been withdrawn, but Adele suspected not even the miners themselves had guessed how far the effect of the blast would travel through the rice paddies. Troops who had climbed out of their dugouts, as they'd been warned to do, would probably be all right. They might have been flung high in the air, but they would come down on a surface more yielding than an air cushion. Those who had remained under cover would at best have been battered against the inside of the dugouts and would probably have been buried as well. Everyone dies. Look, look, Vessie said. They did it. Captain Leary did it. Rather than try to guess what Vessie was talking about, Adele mirrored the command display on the left half of her own. Vessie was focused on Haplinger Pool, the shallow impoundment north of the town. It was the harbor for the Delta, holding at present four freighters similar to those in Brotherhood, as well as the six Pantellarian destroyers. The water had drained back from the pool, and the ships floating there had dropped into the mud. Into the quicksand, more accurately. They fell so suddenly that the muck flowed into any open hatch that dove into it. Unlike water, the mud clung to surfaces, holding the vessels down and continuing to pour into their hulls. Even as Adele watched, a destroyer rolled onto its side when its starboard pontoon had filled and continued to sink, dragging the ship with it. The crew must have removed access plates so that they could work on the float's interior. Another destroyer was stern down and none of them looked quite right as they rested on the quivering brown surface. Humans were crawling out of hatches, but they had nowhere to go. The boarding bridges had sunk when the earth shock lifted and dropped them. Even the ones that aren't sinking will have clogged their thrusters, let alone the throats of their high drives, Vessie crowed. Adele didn't remember her ever before sounding so excited. And if their pumps were on, they've blown out or burned out from trying to suck mud into their tanks. It'd take the sissy a week to repair damage like that, and these are Pantellarians, not RCN. Then, said Adele, suddenly relaxed, it's time for me to act. She keyed two separate switches, the electronic equivalent of a caged mechanical control. There was no real likelihood that Adele would throw a switch unintentionally, but she was a librarian. She preferred not to take chances, even when they weren't really chances. Commissioner Arnaud, this is Lady Mundy, she said. I am speaking on behalf of independent Coursera. Her words were being reproduced through the Pantellarian emergency net on every audio or text device in Hablinger. Arnaud was not being given the choice of keeping this ultimatum a secret from his personnel, though he probably wouldn't realize that until after Adele was done. Independent Coursera offers you and all personnel of the Pantellarian Expeditionary Force the opportunity to surrender on honorable terms and to be repatriated to Pantellaria, Adele said. The console speaker relayed her words to everyone aboard the Kaisha. Corey was sending an alert to Independence Forces in Brotherhood, and the Freccia was lighting her thrusters. Captain Simona had brought all his personnel aboard during the night, but he had obeyed Daniel's orders not to take visible actions which could warn Arnaud. You have twelve hours to accept this offer, Adele said. 
After that time, Independence forces will resume actions to remove the invaders from Corsera. She paused, then said, I must warn you that the additional mines placed under Pantellarian positions have anti-tamper devices. If you attempt to remove them, you will cause the loss of life which we in the Independence Coalition hope to avoid. It would be a pity to kill thousands of people, many of them civilians, on the verge of a peaceful resolution. Adele broke the signal and leaned back on the couch with her eyes closed. It was a moment before she understood that the crew of the Kaisha was cheering. Cheering her and Daniel. That was another entry in our complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a Klein's bottle filled with moon juice and a slice of quantum entangled peach pie, which brings a little piece of heaven to every possible universe. And our thanks and kudos to Travis S. Taylor, author of Kill Before Dying. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. <laughs>